All right, so I'll go ahead and start. My name is Brian Duggan, and I'll be talking today about informal domain-specific languages in Perl 6. Uh, thank you all for coming and attending this talk. Um, I hope you like it. Uh, a little bit about my company. I'd like to thank Promptworks for sending me here. We're a consulting company in Philadelphia. Um, we do coding in a lot of different languages for uh, large and small companies. Okay, so this talk is about uh, domain-specific languages, or DSLs. Um, but first I want to clarify the informal in the title of the talk. So if you look for the definition of DSL um, on Wikipedia, you'll see a lot of languages like HTML or SQL. These are all DSLs. Um, there are languages that are focused on a particular domain, um, but there are not, the DSL has also come to be used in a lot of other ways. So when these days when you're writing an application that generates HTML, you'll have your own language that generates this other Yes, and there are often they don't have specifications, even though they're languages. They're restricted to small communities, and they change a lot, but they're very practical, and they're the things that you type by hand when you're writing programs. Um, a few examples, so templating languages. Um, if you look on Markdown. There's, uh, you know, Wikipedia's Markdown. Um, for SQL generation, we have ORMs. Um, there are also a lot in different languages. In Perl, there's DBIX class or Rose. Then in Python, SQL Alchemy. In Ruby, there's Ar Arrow. And these are all ways of avoiding writing SQL. But you still have your own little isolated informal DSL um, in these to generate these languages. Uh, web micro frameworks are another example. The, the cute syntax that you use to generate your routes where you say get this, post that, and it generates routes. Those are also informal DSLs. So uh, in 2010, um, Martin Fowler wrote a book called Dom Domain Specific Languages and he, broke, he, broke, he um, divided them into two different categories, internal and external. Um, internal DSLs are Languages that are a subset of a more general programming language. And external ones are languages where you're actually parsing it. So you have some sort of parser, but it's not just a subset of, of Python or a subset of Ruby. Um, I'm adding a third category to this talk, which I'm calling variant uh, DSLs. And these are languages that start off as um, a more common language, but you modify it a little bit. And in Perl 6, there's a notion of slangs, which refers to this concept. So for each of these categories, um, internal, external, and variant, I'm going to talk about uh, a Perl 6 technique that can be used to create uh, informal DSLs in this category. We'll start with internal. I'll pick an example from each one, and then um, an application of the technique to generate um, a language. Okay, so we'll start with internal, uh, informal, domain-specific languages. So a mouthful. Um, okay, and what we're going to talk about are the Perl 6 custom operators facilities. Okay, so um, a quick uh, review and explanation of the different types of operators that you see. These are the types of operators in Perl 6. You have infix operators, which have their arguments on the side. Uh, you have prefix operators, like the minus in this case goes before what it's operating on. Uh, you also have postfix, like A++, which operates on the thing before it. Circumfix are around something, and post-circumfix, you know, like taking, in it, taking something out of an array. So these are all um, the different types of operators. 
And you can see that some of them take one argument, some of them take two arguments, right? So the infix and the, or sorry, the prefix and the postfix each take only one argument. Um, after all, they're really just functions. And um, circumfix takes one argument. Um, infix and post circumfix take two arguments. Um, so already, even though you can write A plus B, you can also use operators in what's called a noun form. So if you take the plus and you put some brackets around it and you put an ampersand in front of it, then instantly you've turned your operator into a function that takes two arguments. And conversely, you can go the other way. So if you have any subroutine that takes two arguments, you will automatically have an infix operator. So here we have an example of saying we make a subroutine called plus twice, which takes the first argument and adds two times the second argument. And you can call it with the arguments afterwards, but you can also put an ampersand in front of it, put brackets around it, and then you can say one plus twice two. So out of the box, without doing anything crazy, you already have some interesting constructs for um, any subroutine that takes two arguments. But, of course, what you really want to do is take symbols and use those as arguments. You don't want to put brackets and ampersands everywhere. And to do that, you can define an operator using this syntax. So we say sub infix colon and then less than and then the operator goes in between the angle brackets and then you say the operator. So if we want to say, I'd like to use the word plus to add two things together. We say sub infix plus and it returns x plus y. And then you can say 1 plus 2. Uh, and you get 3. So um, you can do other things too. Let's say you want to make a prefix operator, at, at, or, plus, or postfix operator, plus, 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 okay, which modifies the argument and adds 3 to it. So here we have z equals at, at, 10, and then we say z plus, plus, plus. So what's it going to come out to? I heard somebody say 23, right? So first it's multiplying by 10, multiplying by 2, and then adding 3. Okay, so this is like, this is not making things easier using operators like this. And you're going to quickly run out of things and you'll probably end up with obfuscated code. But luckily, we're not restricted to just these ASCII operators. We can use any operator from Unicode. So let's say we want to define the dot product. Um, as you may remember from math, a dot product of two vectors or two arrays, you multiply the corresponding elements together and then you take the sum, okay? Sum from 1 to n of the corresponding elements from each array. That's the dot product. And there's an operator for it. It's a dot. Um, we can define the dot product, unifix, uh, sorry, sub infix colon dot is, and this is, um, I won't go into this too much, but essentially we're multiplying the corresponding elements and adding them all together. And then if we say 1 comma 2 dot 3 comma 4, we get, let's see if people are paying attention since it's a lunchtime talk. <laughs> okay, 11. <laughs> all right. Um, what about this? So here we can also use, there are Unicode floor characters. You know, don't you hate when you have, you know, decimals in your code? You have to deal with, like, floating points or rational numbers. So let's define a circumfix floor operator. Say, floor of 2.4. 2. This one is 2. Okay, come on. Um, okay, so what happens if we have several operators and we start using them together? Um, so let's say we have a plus operator here, the word plus, and a times operator, which is the word times. We say 1 plus 2 times 3. What do we get? Trouble. <laughs> yep. Trouble. Cobol. Oh, Cobol. Okay, so uh, I heard one nine and one six. So one plus two is three. Three times three is nine. So, you know, we wanted to get seven, but we didn't because what's wrong? Precedence, right. 
Luckily, you can specify the precedence of your operators. <coughs> so if you want to say that um, times is a tighter precedence than plus, you add is tighter here afterwards. Um, is tighter takes an argument, that's another operator. So precedence is all relative. Um, now, 1 plus 2 times 3 is 2 times 3 is 6 plus 1, 7. You get 7. So in addition to is tighter, you could have done it the other way around. You could have defined is looser, say plus is looser than times. You can also say is equiv if two things have the same precedence. If you get an error, say contradicted If you have like a non-transitive precedence, good question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, what about chaining operators? So let's say we have this operator to the power, which is... Uh, um, I don't know COBOL, but it seems like it could be a COBOL operator <laughs> where we, where we want to raise, um, raise the first argument to an exponential value. Um, so 2 to the power 3 to the power 2, what are we going to get? 64, because it's going to be 2 to the 3 to the 2, so 8 squared. Um, but you know, what's happening here is we have 2 to the 3 to the 2, and it's 2 to the 3 to the 2, but uh, you know, really, it should be this way. If we're mathematicians, it should be 2 to the 3 squared. So in this case, what is it that we want to change? The associativity. So luckily, you can change the associativity of your operators, too. Okay, so if it's right associative, <laughs> then you say, is associ right? And now 2 to the 3 to the 2 is 512. 512, yes. Okay. Um, other associativities, you have right associativity, left, asso left associativity, non-associative, which will throw an operator, uh, sorry, throw an error. Um, you have this thing called chain associativity, which is really cool because the less than operator has chain associativity, so you can say one is less than two is less than three, which means one is less than two and two is less than three. Um, you also have list associativity. Uh, which says, take all of these things and let me just make a multi-valued function that I can, I can um, operate on all of them at once. Um, the cross product is list associative. Um, okay, so let's look back at uh, something simple, subtraction. Let's say we make up, let's say, oh, okay, we want to define what it means to subtract one string from another string. So we say it's substituting um, all occurrences of the first string with the empty string. Okay, so we're going to say this is what it means. You take a string and you subtract a letter. It's like deleting all of those letters from the string. So house minus u is hose. All right. Um, so then, what happens when we say 32 minus 2? Uh oh, not good. Right now we get three. So <laughs> that's unfortunate because we don't want 32 minus 2 to be three. Um, luckily. Arg, no good. Okay, luckily we can fix that. We can give types to our operators. Uh, sorry, to our arguments. So we define the arguments. We say they are strings, stir dollar x and stir dollar y. And instead of a sub, it's now a multi. So we have multiple dispatch for functions and multiple dispatch for arguments. So now, when we have a house and a u, which are both strings, and we have 32 minus 3, we get the correct thing. We get hose for the strings, but we still get 29 for the you, numbers. problems if it's ambiguous with the type. I mean, I write programs all the time in Bill 5 where it's not clear yeah. until I use it whether it's a 32 as a string or a number. Well, luckily, you can, it's optional. So Perl 6 has, um, they call it uh, gradual typing or optional typing. So if you don't put the type in, you could run into problems. You, it's right. So it's up to you whether you want to put the restrictions on or not. Um, yeah. Can we use a uh, uh, gradual typing on multi, which is um, if I don't uh, type the signature, it will be the fallback for any uh, other possibility I type? That's right. Yeah. So the, the, so the signature of the function, um, in this case it has types, but you can have multiple dispatch without having types. It will look at the number of arguments, for instance, or names, named arguments. No, I mean for the name, for the same, uh, uh, for example, if you are string, string, uh -huh. int, int, uh -huh. in other way, use uh, the non-type uh, multi. Uh, you, you, can use, you can use them uh, with different, 
different types of signatures, mixing mixing types and non-types. So what if, what if I wrote like zero at one of the places? In uh, the documents? Let's, we'll get to that in a second. I'm going to get have a few more. <laughs> okay, so what if we put in things like uh, constants? I think this is what you're saying, right? Okay, so um, we have strings here as two arguments, we re and that works fine. We subtract, a, what if we want to say we subtract an int from a string, meaning we take a few characters off the end. Um, and if we put a constant here, that also takes precedence. So here we can say an escalator minus electricity, and we get stairs. Um, even though they're strings, we have um, a more narrow type than the string type. So we get, you know, we can take the A's out of catamaran, we can subtract six letters from catamaran, um, and then 10 minus 5 still works. Um, okay, here's an example. So Python has this really nice operator, actually. It's called the percent operator, and um, you can use it. There are two different ways to format strings in Python. Uh, one is with format, and one is with percent. Um, the percent one is very nice. It takes a string, and then it takes either um, either a number or a list, and it kind of works like sprintf. So we can make percent work like that in Perl 6 if we want to. So here we say um, when you have a string and a number, we just do an sprintf. If you have a string and a list, you do the same thing. You flatten your list. You pass it as arguments to sprintf. Then we can say this is percent %d, and it'll put the 40 where the percent %d is. We can say pi is about 0.2f, e is about 0.2f, and that's the symbol pi, and that's e, and so this works just like that. We get this is 40, pi is about 3.14, e is about 2.72. Um, so let's look at an application of this to um, some of the examples in the beginning for domain-specific languages. Um, so generating SQL. Um, so some of the techniques that you might see in various DSLs, um, in various ORMs, or ways of generating SQL, you'll see you know, method chaining, where you'll have, you know, you'll keep calling like join or do something like this, and at the end of the day, you get, you get your SQL. You'll see operator overloading sometimes. Um, and then more common than not, you see I'm calling it data structure abuse, you know, where you've got like, OK, all arrays. Arrays mean or, and hashes mean and, um, or you know, you have nested data structures which somehow get turned into SQL. Um, how many people have worked with ORMs or use ORMs sometimes? Okay, so at least you guys, you know what I'm talking about with some of these um, constructs. Um, so we have new techniques with some of those things that we just talked about. Um, the operators can, um, all those operators could be used to generate SQL. So we could set, write something like this, user plus address, name equals Ed, and full name equals Ed Jones, where we're using um, equals and equals and and, and we're going to redefine those depending on the type of what's coming in. We can use the circumfix, post-circumfix operator um, to filter things. And um, the way we would do that is we would have, for instance, we would have a table class, and then the infix plus takes two tables. Uh, so user and address then um, would take two tables and generate something else. Um, similarly, we could do something with equals and and, and we could say, all right, equals takes two columns, or maybe takes a column and a value, and returns a filter of some sort. Um, and then we could do something, something else. Uh, so you have a lot of flexibility if you're designing an ORM or something to generate SQL in um, Perl 6. But um, what I think is interesting is that although operators can be used to generate SQL, um, operators have already been used to express SQL. Namely, before there was SQL, there was relational algebra. So in the 70s, when EF Cod came up with SQL, he first started talking about the mathematics behind it and how you would express um, queries um, in, this, uh, with this, in this algebra. And he had definitions for things like projection, selection, rename, natural join, semi-join, all these things that we now uh, use SQL to express. So what we could do in Perl 6 is instead of um, inventing something new, we could reuse some of these operators that 
of already have well-defined semantics for querying um, data. So, for instance, we could have the infix uh, bow tie operator make a natural join. And then you could say users join addresses like that. And in fact, you wouldn't be making up something new because there's, al there's already precedent for the way these operators behave. Um, you could do the same thing with the projection operator, turn it into a select. Um, so project name and age would turn that into a select statement. Um, so the uh, conclusion of this section is that custom operators are very cool and when you're making a subset of a language into a DSL, um, they are a good way to do that in Perl 6. Okay, so part two is external informal domain specific languages. And for this, um, Perl 6 has a feature a, a lot of you probably heard about already called grammars. Um, so, some typical examples of um, external uh, DSLs um, include templating languages and wikis. And so, for the next section, what I'm going to do is take an example of one of these languages and we're going to go through it and I'll show you um, what it's like to write a grammar to parse uh, a language like that. Okay, so the language we're going to look at is called Slim. How many people have heard of Slim? Nobody. Wow. Okay. <laughs> no Ruby programmers in the room, I guess. <laughs> um, so Slim is kind of a cool language. It's popular among Ruby programmers, and th this is what it looks like. Um, it's indentation-based, um, and it sort of starts like this. It has HTML over here, and then you indent a little bit. You get head and then a little bit more for title, then you can go back for body, and so it's very terse. So it's actually kind of nice because you can type things out, you just indent, and then instantly you get this like nested, um, this nested HTML comes out of it. You don't have to type any angle brackets, and um, so it's actually pretty cool. Uh, okay. So let's take a look. First, we're going to look at how we could parse this language. Um, and then we're going to look at how, given the structure that we just saw as an input, we're going to generate a data structure that's the DOM, an HTML DOM. And it sounds hard, but it's actually not too bad. OK, so parsing a language. So I'm going to go, this is going to be a little bit of an overview, and you can refer to the documentation for more details about how some of these things work. Um, so essentially, uh, Perl 6 has grammars. They're first class objects in Perl 6. Um, declaring a grammar is kind of like making a, declaring a class, except instead of declaring methods, you have regular expressions which are associated with the grammar. So we have a collection of regular expressions here. Um, certain types of regular expressions are called rules, and some of them are called tokens. So if a regular expression doesn't do any backtracking, it's called a token. And if the white space in your regular expression is significant, then it's called a rule. Those are the only differences between rules, tokens, and regular expressions. But they're really all, the, they're, they're all a type of regular expression with additional constraints. So this HTML here, where, uh, sorry, this slim code here, where we have HTML, head, um, you can sort of see the pattern where you have, you have some indentation and then you have a tag and then you may have some text after the tag. So um, that's basically it for the language. So the top level rule here is one or more lines separated by uh, an end of line character. End of line is a series of carriage returns. <coughs> so if we parse this particular code, if we parse this using this grammar, we end up with a match object. So this is a nested data structure, and the structure looks like the rules that we just had in our grammar. So we end up with a sequence of lines, and each line has a tag, and it has may have some indentation. Uh, 
Um, so these can be very cumbersome to work with. So generally, instead of parsing something and getting a big match object, the way to do something interesting with a grammar is to set up things that happen during the parse. So um, the way you do that is essentially, uh, so a grammar can basically have an object associated with it. And then every time a particular rule is reached, this, the method of the same name on that object gets called. So if you have a method called line, if you have an object with a method called line, then while it's parsing and it hits a line, it calls your method. And it sends you the current line. It sends you the current? It sends you the current line. Okay. Um, so here we have um, our grammar, which had tokens, tags, text, and indentation. And we're going to make a class that has similar methods, one called tag, one called text, one called indentation. And basically what we have to do is say, here's what you do when you see a tag, or here's what you do when you see indentation. Um, and then creating a new object, we say my dollar dom equals dom dot new, and we call slim dot parse, and then the actions parameter sends the um, sends the object whose methods are going to be called. Okay, so here is our algorithm for parsing slim. We're going to go through this indentation this indentation based format, and we're going to keep a stack with us. And we're going to have a little node class that's got parent nodes and child nodes, so basic data structure that's a tree. Okay? And when you see a tag, you push a new node onto the stack. And when you see text, you're going to add some text to your node. Then when you see indentation, you pull it off the stack. Okay, so this, um, this sounds a little confusing, so what we're going to do now is walk through an example of seeing this algorithm at work um, before I show you the Perl 6 code to do it so that you believe that it works. Okay, so here's our, here's our um, text on the right that we're parsing. The slim text has HTML, head, title, body, and on the left we've got two things that are going to sort of keep going. We've got a stack that we're going to push and pop from, and we've got a tree that we're going to connect to when we hit indentation in the text on the right. Okay, so let's go. First line is HTML. Uh, indentation is at level zero, and there's nothing on the stack, so we push an HTML tag onto our stack. Then we move on to the next line, where we have indentation level one and stack one. So a reminder of the algorithm, you want the level of indentation to be the same as the stack. So if it's the same, the stack is one, indentation is one, you're good. When indentation gets too small, that's when you're going to change things. Okay, so indent one, stack one, we push head onto the stack, and we move to the next line. Okay, indentation level two, stack two, it's the same, so, so far so good, so we push title onto the stack, and then we set the title, we, set, we run into text. Um, I'm going to skip that for this demo. Um, and then we move on to the next one. Okay, now something changed. The indent is, is now one, which is less than the stack, which is three. So, because the indentation is less than the stack, we pop from the stack twice. Okay, so we go pop, pop, and we put it down here with the tree. And every time we pop from the stack, we connect a node with the node before it. So title is connected to, H to head, and head is actually connected to HTML. Okay, so we, now our stack is down to one, and our tree has, it sort of looks like a linked list at this point. Okay, we move on to the next one, which is H1. Oh, sorry, and we push the body on afterwards. Then we move on to the next tag, which is H1. Okay, again, now we're back where we have indent and stack are the same. So um, all we have to do is push the H1 on. And then we run into the text. We set the text of the H1. 
And then finally, we get back to level zero. Once again, indent is below stack. So we are going to pop from the stack three times and attach these. Um, so we pop once, oops, pop once, pop twice, and then, so these are connected to each other. And then when we pop the final time, we're connecting to something we already have. So we end up with a DOM. Okay, so here's our DOM tree, HTML, head, title, and HTML body, H1. So um, it's a little tricky to walk through that, but um, what's kind of cool is you can apply the same thing to making an abstract syntax tree when you're parsing a language. I'm not going to do that. Um, okay, so what does this look like in Perl 6? So now that you know the algorithm, it's, it's actually really straightforward. So here's our node class. The node class has a tag, um, which is a string. So uh, again, these are optional, but these are types that you can put there um, if you want to constrain the types of your attributes. So we have a tag attribute. We have a text attribute. The isRW um, means that there's going to be a read-write accessor. And we need that for text because we're setting the text um, after we put it on the stack. And then we have a parent, which is another node. And we have an array of children. So this is a, this is a data structure which has uh, it's a tree, and you have sort of pointers in both directions, right? So you have a pointer to your parent, and you have an array of children. Uh, the DOM class, we have, so we have this stack here, which is, um, which we're going to use. We're going to keep track of this while we're parsing, and then we have the top of the tree here, which is a node. So the my declares just a lexical variable, and then. Um, has declares an attribute. And so now, okay, just to refresh your memory, the slim grammar has tag, text, and indentation. And so we need to make three methods, one called tag, one called text, one called indentation, which say what happens when you reach those particular, um, those particular uh, points in the grammar. OK, so back to the algorithm. Rule number one, when you see a tag, push a new node onto the stack. So here we have a method tag. The argument dollar slash uh, is conventionally uh, used to represent the match object. So this is the, what was captured. It comes in. Um, it's not exactly a string. Um, it's, a, it's a match. So if you want to set the tag to it, you have to use this tilde, which will stringify it. Um, the colons are another way of, pa of specifying parameters. If you don't like parentheses to wrap your arguments, you can use a colon instead. So this makes a new node for a particular tag and just pushes it onto the stack. Okay, when you see text, set the text of the top node. So here we have a method called text, and we just say the top node, you say star minus one uh, to reference the top node, dot text equals the incoming text. Okay, so not not that much to it. Um, and then the trickiest part is what happens when you see indentation, because now we have to pop until the size of the stack is the same as the level of indentation. Okay, so basically, you know, once you sort of say it explicitly, it's not that bad. While at stack is greater than at dollar indent. Okay, so there's a little bit of magic here because the dollar slash indent refers to the um, element of the match object that's named indent. So before we started this, you saw that there was an indent in some of the matches, and um, that'll tell you how many levels of indentation you have. Uh, so, um, so that dollar node is popping off of the top of the stack. Um, and then um, this with essentially is just saying, make sure it's defined. So it's kind of like if, and then do an assignment, but only if it's defined. So we take the top of the stack here, and we assign the node, the parent of the current node to be the top. And we take our node, and we push it onto the children of that node. Um, OK, so that's about it. There's also a way to dump 
which you can do recursively by printing out different levels of indentation. I'll sort of skip through that. Um, but all in all, the code is not too bad for doing all that parsing. OK, and here's what you get. OK, so for a couple of minutes here, I'm going to say a few words about slangs. Essentially, um, slangs are a structured way to modify the grammar. So Rakuto, the implementation of Perl 6, uses NQP, which has Perl 6 colon colon grammar, which is just like the grammar that you just saw, except it's actually parsing Perl 6. And you can mess with it. So this is what you can do right now with slangs. Um, so at the beginning, in a begin block during compile time, if you print out the keys of percent star lang, you'll see Perl 6 grammar, Perl 6 actions, and all of the things that are being used to parse your current program. Um, they're also available in variables called dollar tilde, named after the different uh, languages. So dollar tilde main refers to the, the parser of the main program. And you can get the grammar, you can get the grammar, and you can get the actions. Um, so if you want to see, um, this by the way is called the language braid. So um, all these different languages are being used together to parse your Perl 6 program. So if you want to change one of them, well, first, if you want to see what they look like, you can say dash dash target equals parse, and you'll see the parse tree that's generated while your Perl 6 program is being parsed. Then, if you look in the source for Perl 6, you can see the definitions of these, and they look just like the grammar that we just made up. So you might see, um, uh, so they have these things like statement, statement list, name, identifier, and if you want to modify it, like let's say instead of sub, we want to use the word lambda, then um, essentially you can redefine the token. And you can say this token now, instead of matching the string lambda, matches the string, instead of sub, matches the string lambda. Um, very quickly, there's a handy operator for taking a grammar, just like you can take a you can take a class and apply, we just saw something called a partial class, which is like a, a little piece of a role. So Perl 6 has something called but, which says, make this little anonymous role that has these methods and, and override those methods in this particular object. Um, and you can do the same thing with grammars, where you can override a few tokens in a grammar. So long story short, um, you say lang main equals the main grammar, but this is what my um, subs look like. They start with lambda instead of starting with sub. So that's sort of a long explanation for something that sort of makes sense at the end. The but just kind of changes one little piece of it. I, I'm going to finish real quick. I'm almost out of time, and then I'll see if I can take a question. Um, and then after that, you can say lambda foo, and instead of saying sub foo, and it'll declare a sub for you. And by the way, if you put it somewhere else, these changes to the grammar are lexically scoped. So inside a scope, you can use the grammar you just made up. There are a few examples of slangs in the ecosystem already. Um, I won't talk too much about those, but you can look them up. Um, there's still some work to be done for mm -hmm. syntax for using slangs. Um, but all in all, uh, they're there, they exist, um, and in conclusion, we've seen some examples of uh, creating um, informal DSLs using um, changes to the syntax um, by parsing something externally or by modifying Perl 6 itself. So, thank you very much. I'm out of time, but come talk to me afterwards if you have questions. Yeah.